Thank you for everyone that is joining us this evening. My topic tonight is what's new in breast cancer treatment. And the good news is that there's a lot that's new. Um, it's, it's actually a really exciting time uh, to be a medical oncologist, especially um, a breast oncologist. We're not, only, um, we're not only having new treatments, but I think um, it's fair to say that there's a lot more understanding in terms of breast cancer concepts and understanding the different types of breast cancers and specific treatments as it relates to them. So I'm going to, let's see, get started here. My, my first um, slide, whenever I do a, a talk on breast cancer, I always want to kind of try to drive home the point that the two strongest risk factors for getting breast cancer are being a woman and being over the age of 50. And that gets all of us a one in eight chance of, of having breast cancer. So that the absence of a family history doesn't really protect us from breast cancer. It can increase the risk, but just being a woman and being over the age of 50 um, ends up um, resulting in a, at least a one in eight chance of, of developing breast cancer. If we look at uh, women who've had breast cancer, Um, I'm learning how to use the cursor here. If we look at women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, the largest group here is this turquoise group, and that's about 70, 80, 70 to 80% of women. These are women that don't have family histories. These are women that we would consider to have sporadic breast cancer. There's probably another 5 to 15% that are familial. So these are women who have a clear family history of breast cancer, but we don't, we don't have an identifiable mutation um, that explains why there's cancer in the family. There's likely a mutation there that we just yet don't know how to identify. And then there's another 10 to 15% that are truly hereditary that are associated with a known mutation. One thing that's new, I think, in the last few years, few, few years certainly, is that we are really recognizing that there's many, many mutations that are associated with breast cancer. So by far and away, the two most common mutations um, are the BRCA1 and BRCA2, and these are kind of the breast cancer genes that people hear about. 20 years ago, these were the only two genes that we knew how to test for. And then over the last decades, there have been more and more genes that have been recognized that can increase a woman's risk for developing breast cancer and, importantly, um, can be in some situations associated with other types of cancers, such as ovarian or uterine or colon. And so um, we're, we're using genetic testing much, much more than we ever have. Some professional societies actually are advocating that all women uh, diagnosed with breast cancer should undergo genetic testing. I don't think that that's standard of care yet, but it, does, um, it is moving in a direction where more and more women are being tested. Before I um, get started on some of the newer treatments, I thought it would be helpful to review some terminology because um, as you'll find out later in the talk, really the new the, the, the specific treatments are really directed at specific types of breast cancer. And so it's important to just kind of have a basic understanding of some of the terminology that we'll be using. For the most part, every breast cancer um, gets tested for certain types of receptors. There's um, the estrogen and progesterone receptor that gets tested, and then also something called HER2 nu. So estrogen receptors are... Um, receptors that are in breast cancer cells that can basically stimulate the cell to grow and divide in the presence of estrogen. So it's cancers that are estrogen receptor positive, um, are, it's not so much that estrogen has caused the cancer or that there's a problem necessarily with estrogen in the body, but estrogen in the body could potentially stimulate cancer cells to grow and divide. So that gives us an opportunity for treatment uh, modality by reducing the amount of estrogen that cancer cells might see, uh, hence inhibiting their growth if they're there. Probably about 70% of cancer, breast cancers have estrogen receptors that are positive. Maybe 20, 25% are estrogen receptor negative. The other marker that uh, gets tested is something called HER2-NU 
and HER2 new is a protein that is present in cells, and it's, it's present in normal cells, and it tells cells basically or triggers cells to grow and divide. And there's probably about 15 or 20% of breast cancers that have too much of that um, protein, and those are called HER2 positive breast cancers. Those cancers are more rapidly growing, but importantly, we have a very effective treatment um, to a, that, that targets that HER2 abnormality. So already, right there, just in going over the receptors, you can see you can have, we can have several different combinations. And this, again, the specific subcategory of uh, breast cancer is going to be treated differently. So we can have cancers that are estrogen receptor positive, HER2 negative, um, estrogen receptor positive, HER2 positive, or estrogen receptor negative, HER2 positive, or another category where all of the receptors are negative, and that's a special type of, um, a unique type of breast cancer called a triple negative breast cancer. So this is just a diagram kind of uh, outlining what I just went through. So um, one of the most important concepts that has been evolving over the years is that breast cancer is many, many, many different types of diseases. And even in, even in this diagram where it's saying 70% are estrogen receptor positive, there's many, many subcategories even in that group as well as the HER2 positive group, which again is 15 to 20% of cancers and many, many different subcategories too in the triple negative. So that's really, um, that's really important if we're looking at um, a specific treatment for a specific type of cancer to be able to hone in on that, the unique um, aspects of, of a particular cancer. Another kind of important concept here before we get going is to just kind of get an idea of um, what we call staging. So staging, we stage any cancer. Staging basically um, uh, is, a, is a way that we uh, look at or try to define the extent of the cancer. So uh, most cancers are staged, stage one through four. Um, actually in breast cancer there is a stage zero. I didn't put that on there. Um, but in breast cancer, stage one tumors are less than two centimeters and the lymph nodes are negative, lymph nodes under the arm. In stage two or three breast cancers, the tumors are either a little bigger or um, there's lymph node involvement. And then in stage four breast cancer, that's where the cancer has spread outside of the breast and the lymph nodes and has spread to the bone or the lung or the liver or, or other places in the body. One important um, you know, aspect of staging is because the staging kind of helps us understand the goals of our treatment. The, for stage one, two, and three breast cancers, the cancer's been removed in the breast and the lymph nodes um, with surgery, possibly radiation has been given to that area. But we recognize that there's a possibility that microscopic cells might have escaped from the breast uh, and gotten into the bloodstream and the cells might be nesting somewhere in the body before we even know the cancer is there. And so our treatments that we're gonna be talking about here, our treatments are really geared at treating the possibility that microscopic cells could be somewhere in the body and knowing that at some point they could start to grow and divide and show themselves at some point in time. And if that were the case, then we would have breast, breast cancer cells that are now in the bone or the lung or the liver, and then that would be stage four cancer. So the goal of the treatment with stage one, two, and three cancers is really to reduce the risk of the cancer coming back or improve the cure rate. With stage four cancers, um, right now in 2021, for the most part, we're not, our treatments are not able to cure stage four breast cancers. So the goal of the treatment there is to prolong a woman's life, uh, potentially relieve symptoms that may be related to the cancer, uh, keep the quality of life up as long as we can. Um, and, and really, the, the women with stage four cancer now are living years and years, much longer than even five or six years ago because of our newer treatments. There's a new aspect to the staging system which has been um, 
important, I think, clinically in that historically staging just takes into account the size of the tumor and whether or not the lymph nodes are involved. But the, uh, the new staging system in the last few years now is taking also into account not only the size and the lymph nodes, but also taking into account what we call the biology of the tumor. Um, so how aggressive or not aggressive are the cancer cells? And this is important because it, we really are recognizing that it's not all about size of the cancer or it's not all about whether or not the lymph nodes are involved in the sense that we recognize that there can be small lymph node negative breast cancers that are more aggressive and have a higher chance of spreading than some cancers that might be larger, maybe even have gone to the lymph nodes, but they're very, very slow growing. And so a new staging, we have a, we have a new staging system now that takes kind of the biology into account along with the, the standard size and uh, lymph node status. Another bit of terminology, and uh, this impacts our treatment recommendations as well, is the menopausal status of a woman. So a woman who is still, younger women who um, ovaries are still making estrogen um, are considered what we call premenopausal. Um, so their ovaries are making estrogen. That doesn't always correlate to having periods. Actually, sometimes the ovaries can still be making estrogen, but a woman may not be menstruating. Postmenopausal is where the ovaries are no longer making estrogen, but the body has other ways to make estrogen through the ad adrenal glands. And then there can be this perimenopausal period where it's kind of a transition, and that can sometimes be um, a couple of years. But our treatment, what kind of treatment is appropriate, uh, may depend in part on the menopausal status of the woman. And then one last um, kind of bit of terminology is um, something called adjuvant therapy versus neoadjuvant therapy. So adjuvant therapy is kind of what I alluded to earlier. Um, adjuvant therapy just means that this is treatment that's being given after surgery, no visible cancer, no known cancer is um, identified. And we give it in, with stage one, two, and three breast cancers to treat the possibility that microscopic cells could be present somewhere in the body. And by giving adjuvant therapy after surgery, it can help improve the cure rate and reduce the risk of the cancer coming back. There's been a um, more of a practice in some situations of doing what we call neoadjuvant therapy, and we'll be talking about this more. But this is treatment that's actually given before surgery. Um, and it, so it's typically, or most commonly right now, chemotherapy, and we use it in specific situations. But it gives us an important indication um, on, it indicates basic, it helps us understand how sensitive or resistant the cancer is to the neoadjuvant therapy because we have the opportunity to see how much cancer uh, may remain after the treatment when the woman goes to surgery. So um, just to kind of review very quickly some of the permutations um, and some of the considerations that we uh, look, look at when we're um, getting ready to make treatment recommendations. So the stage of the cancer, stage one through four, hormone receptors, estrogen positive, estrogen negative, the HER2 receptor, the age, the menopausal status. Is there an indication to do treatment before surgery or after surgery? So just a, a few things on um, the anti-estrogen treatment. Um, so again, about three quarters of breast cancers are um, hormone receptor positive or estrogen receptor positive, meaning that uh, the cancer cells, <coughs> excuse me, may be stimulated by estrogen that's in the body. And so one of the ways that we can reduce the chance of cancer recurring is by giving these anti-estrogen pills. And there's, there's two general categories, and these honestly have, there's not, there's not a, a, a new anti-estrogen medicine uh, in the last several years. These have, tamoxifen's probably been around for about, I don't know, 60 years. Um, tamoxifen is an estrogen receptor blocker, so it blocks estrogen that the body's making. 
and it is effective in women that are premenopausal or postmenopausal. Aromatase inhibitors decrease the production of estrogen inside the cell, and they really only work in women that are in menopause. They only work uh, when the ovaries are not making estrogen. And there's three types, or th yeah, there's three different um, aromatase inhibitors. Everything has two different names to make it especially confusing, but the, the brand names of the three are Arimidex, Vimara, and Aromacin. They all work equally well. They all have similar side effects. Often, somebody does better with one than the other. What is new, or not so much a new treatment, but a new tool to help us understand how long to keep somebody on this medicine is something called the breast cancer index test. So uh, typically, tamoxifen, we have recommended that at least for five years, and in some situations, 10 years. And for women that are in, or for postmenopausal women that are on aromatase inhibitors, for the most part, generally five years has been the recommendation. But there's been some sense that um, in some situations there could be benefit of uh, either seven years or 10 years. The problem is we, when, when, when large studies are done with a thousand women who take it for five years and a thousand women that take it for 10 years, and there's a small percent benefit in taking it for 10 years, really what's happening is there's a group of women that are benefiting significantly for being on it for 10 years, and then there's a whole group of women that are not benefiting um, being on it for 10 years, but on average, it works out to a small percent benefit for the whole group. So this breast cancer index test allows us to identify and hone in on those who benefit from longer duration and the large chunk of women that don't benefit from being on it longer. The, the t what we do um, basically is that the tumor tissue from the original diagnosis is still in the pathology lab. It, um, the, the tissue is in a paraffin wax block in the pathology lab, and when somebody's been on the medicine coming up to the five-year mark, we're able to request to have the tumor the original tumor tissue sent off for uh, molecular testing. And um, based on the results of that analysis, we get back a report that tells us, one, what is the risk of a recurrence of the cancer between year five and 10 from the diagnosis? And two, does continuing on the anti-estrogen treatment lower that risk? So this is um, just a, a, a sample of what one of the breast cancer index reports might look like. So we would send the tumor tissue out, and this particular report is saying that the risk of a late recurrence between year five and 10 of the diagnosis is 2.2%, and continuing on with the anti-estrogen treatment doesn't benefit, or doesn't meaningfully make that very low number lower. Sometimes that number might be 10%, and the molecular analysis may indicate that continuing with the anti-estrogen treatment uh, reduces the risk, reduces that 10%. Sometimes the, the number comes back 10%, and the answer is that continuing with anti-estrogen treatment doesn't lower the risk. Um, and so even though there may still be a higher risk of recurrence, continuing on with the medicine doesn't help meaningfully lower that. This is something that's been really helpful, and we've been using it more and more just this last year. It was January of this year where it became part of the kind of national consensus guidelines to use as a tool to help in this decision uh, with regard to duration of therapy. Another thing that is um, really uh, new, not so much this last year, but probably new in the last two or three years, very importantly, there's been this question in younger women, women in their 20s and their 30s, um, as to whether or not, uh, in addition to giving this estrogen blocker tamoxifen, the question had remained, is there some benefit, ca cancer benefit of basically uh, taking those young women and putting them into menopause chemically um, is there a cancer benefit in doing that? Or does just giving tamoxifen alone, is that, is that the same as putting, uh, is the benefit the same as putting these young women into menopause? 
We have really definitive data now that in these young women with estrogen receptor positive cancers that inducing menopause with either a, a monthly shot of something called Lupron or in some cases actually removing the ovaries and permanently putting them into menopause, that that can significantly improve the cure rate. So that's something that um, we're doing much more in the last, uh, last two years. It definitely is a conversation. As you can imagine, it um, does come with side effects or can come with side effects um, for some women. But um, from a cancer standpoint, um, it, it can be very beneficial. The other, uh, from a young, younger woman perspective, the other thing that uh, we're re we've really made improvements on is the fertility preservation. We um, have a close uh, relationship with some of the local reproductive um, physicians and, and practices, and uh, we now can very efficiently, uh, in somebody, a young woman newly diagnosed with breast cancer, we very efficiently can uh, refer them to a reproductive practice, and, and safely uh, there can be a process of collecting uh, eggs and or harvesting, or harvesting eggs and or embryos prior to us starting chemotherapy. So this allows them the option of potentially having children uh, in the event that the chemotherapy were to put them into permanent menopause. In addition, we have other ways of potentially protecting their ovaries, and we're doing this more where we can kind of at least temporarily turn down the ovaries during chemotherapy so that there's a better chance when they're done with the chemotherapy that they've maintained ovarian function and, and can have children later in life if, if they um, choose to do that. One very important uh, point um, that often is counterintuitive to people, but there's no evidence that pregnancy increases the risk of having a breast cancer recurrence. So for young women who've had breast cancer, there is a risk of recurrence, but there's no indication that pregnancy increases that risk. So I, I would say more and more we are seeing young women who've kind of gone through breast cancer treatment a few years later, moving on and um, getting pregnant and uh, having a family. So um, on to the next subject would be who, who benefits from chemotherapy. So we've, so we've talked a little bit about the adjuvant anti-estrogen treatment, the, um, the anti-estrogen pills for stage one, two, and three breast cancer. Now the question is, well, who benefits from chemotherapy? Um, well, most HER2 positive cancers benefit. Those, again, are cancers that are uh, faster growing but we have a great treatment to combat that. The chemotherapy is given with a targeted type of a treatment called Herceptin, an antibody, very effective, and I'll, I'll talk more about that at the end. Most uh, triple negative breast cancers, so these are cancers, again, that are estrogen, progesterone receptor, and HER2 negative. Uh, so most triple negative cancers benefit from chemotherapy, realizing that these are not cancers that are stimulated by estrogen. So giving estrogen blockers to these patients is not of benefit. And really the, the primary way that we can combat um, any potential cells that might be in the body is through chemotherapy. And then there's some um, estrogen receptor positive HER2 negative cancers that um, benefit from chemotherapy. Um, we know that, um, or we think that uh, most stage three breast cancers uh, that are estrogen positive HER2 negative benefit from chemo. But there, there is um, a, a definitely a, a large group of estrogen positive HER2 negative cancers where we think they probably don't benefit from chemo or we're really not certain if there's a benefit of chemo. And so there's an a, uh, important tool, that an, another genomic tool that we use um, that can help with this. And we're using this more and more, particularly in the last year. This is something, the, the oncotype and the mammal print are, um, are basically gen, um, tools or tests again, where the tumor tissue at the time of diagnosis is sent off to a lab and genes and mutations are analyzed within the tumor tissue and it gives us a, a better sense of the aggressiveness or 
non-aggressiveness of the cancer. So we've used Oncotype, we've used the Oncotype test for years for um, lymph node negative breast cancers. In the last year, we have uh, studies now that really are showing how we can use it in lymph node positive breast cancers, generally, lymph, generally one to three lymph nodes. Um, and Mammoprint 2 can help. So again, the, I, this is kind of getting back to the idea um, or the growing recognition that um, just because a cancer might be large or have lymph node involvement, it doesn't mean that it's more aggressive than a smaller cancer that may be lymph node negative. So we realized that, um, the way I actually kind of explain the oncotype to patients is that we could, we could have 10 tumors that look the exact, from 10 different women that look the exact same under the microscope. They can all be one centimeter, they can all be lymph node negative, estrogen positive, HER2 negative. If, and if all, all those 10 women get anti-estrogen treatment, we know that eight or nine of them are not gonna have the cancer come back. One or two of them will have the cancer come, or may have the cancer come back. But the question is, how do we hone in on those one or two that would benefit from getting chemotherapy to help improve the cure rate? And how can we identify those eight or nine that don't need chemotherapy because the cancer has a low risk of coming back just with the anti-estrogen treatment? So this is how we're using the Oncotype and the Mammoprint. So this is, um, there's a lot going on here, but let's, um, Let's hone in on the left slide. So this is um, on the top here. It's an Oncotype report. And in this patient, the lymph nodes are negative. And we, we've submitted the tumor tissue. And it's been tested. And now we get back an, uh, what we call a recurrence score. So in this case, the recurrence score came back at 10. And what that recurrence score of 10 correlates to, where's my cursor? Um, I lost my cursor, but what that score of 10 um, uh, basically implies is that assuming the woman took five years of anti-estrogen treatment, the chance of the cancer coming back or metastasizing is 3%, very low number. And so chemotherapy is not going to meaningfully lower that number. And there in the, the third box there, you can say the absolute benefit of chemotherapy is less than 1%. So again, recurrence score of 10 correlates to 3% risk in the next nine years of the cancer becoming stage four, assuming that the woman takes five years of anti-estrogen treatment and chemotherapy is not gonna help there. This example over here on the right is an example of how we're now using it with lymph node positive breast cancer. So again, the same score of 10 now, maybe because the lymph nodes are involved, there is a higher risk of recurrence. Um, it's 12%, but because that score still is low, even this, again, this 12% correlates to what's the risk of a recurrence in the next nine years, assuming that the woman takes five years of anti-estrogen treatment. The, the test, this, this score of 10 would indicate that chemotherapy is not going to be able to meaningfully lower that 12%. So um, this, is a, this, this patient in particular on the right would have gotten chemotherapy five or six years ago because there was a thought that, gosh, if the lymph nodes are involved, um, there should be, um, there's likely a benefit of chemotherapy. This is another example of a higher score. So here the recurrence score is 32 which uh, correlates to a 20% risk of the cancer becoming stage four in the next nine years with anti-estrogen treatment. And the benefit of chemotherapy in this situation is significant. And so chemotherapy here, adding chemotherapy to the endocrine therapy is going to improve the cure rate. So these, these kind of genomic tools we're, we're, just do, you're, we're using every day in the clinic and we're really, ex just even this last year, the indications for them have expanded. Um, and it really allows us to hone in on the appropriate treatment for 
each individual, honing in on who benefits from more aggressive treatment with chemotherapy, improving the cure rate, and who, who, does not benef who doesn't benefit from chemotherapy. Another really important um, and kind of whole new strategy uh, that, we've, that we're using more and more is this idea of neoadjuvant therapy. So again, this is chemotherapy mostly that's being given before surgery. Um, and so the, we, we, used to, we used to only we're primarily do this in um, a situation where a woman had a large tumor and she really did not want uh, to move forward with the mastectomy. And so we would use the, the chemotherapy before surgery to shrink down the tumor with the hopes that we'd make it amenable to a, a lumpectomy and um, she'd be able to avoid the mastectomy. So we, we primarily used it just to uh, um, give more surgical options uh, to the patient. Um, we're using it now more in the last, uh, last year or two, recognizing that if there's a lot of lymph node involvement at the, at the time of diagnosis, we potentially can reduce the need to remove many lymph nodes and we can uh, potentially remove fewer lymph nodes and reduce the, the chance of uh, something called lymphedema or swelling of the arm. What's really new and exciting and very helpful now is we, we for a long time we recognized that, well, actually, let me back up. The, the group that we primarily are using neoadjuvant chemotherapy for are for stage two and stage three breast cancers that are triple negative or HER2 positive. And in, so in those cancers, we've known uh, for a long time that if we gave the chemotherapy before surgery, completed the chemotherapy, when the woman went on to surgery, if there was no residual cancer in the breast at the time of surgery, we recognized and, and knew that there was a much lower chance of something, there was a low chance of something coming back elsewhere in the body um, in the years to come. If there was what we call a partial response, meaning that there still was some residual cancer in the breast or the lymph nodes, there, there still definitely is a chance that the cancer would not come back elsewhere in the body, but it was higher than if uh, there had been a complete response. What was frustrating is that fact was known for years, but we didn't really have anything to offer to those women that had a partial response after the chemotherapy, um, we just recognized that they were at a little bit higher risk of a recurrence. In the last year or two, um, studies have now, both in the triple negative world and in the HER2 positive um, population, we've now recognized that if there's a partial response, if there's remaining cancer in the breast um, at the time of surgery, we can then do a different treatment after surgery that's going to help improve the cure rate for, those group of, for that group of women. Um, and so the, the response of the cancer to the chemotherapy helps us direct and optimize the best uh, post-surgical uh, treatment to improve the cure rate. We don't do this very often um, in, or we're not doing it nearly as often in estrogen receptor positive or HER2, estro, estrogen receptor positive and HER2 negative cancers. Uh, we, we do it sometimes if we're trying to um, avoid a mastectomy, but the role of this is much more established right now in the triple negative and HER2 positive um, patients. Another uh, point I just wanted to make um, is uh, this kind of growing recognition that the, a group of drugs that have historically been um, uh, given to treat osteoporosis um, has uh, been found to um, have, if you will, anti-breast cancer properties in the sense that um, these medicines can actually help reduce the risk of breast cancer recurrence. So um, I, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the old, well, I guess we still use them sometimes, Fosamax, Boniva, Actinil. These are kind of oral, what we call bisphosphonates. They, they can have side effects. Um, but there, there are IV or intravenous forms of those drugs, um, one called Reclast or Zomeda, 
or there's another group of drugs that are similar called Exgeva and Prolia. And um, these drugs are still used to treat osteoporosis, uh, but we use them in the breast cancer world um, in some situations because they actually help reduce the risk of breast cancer recurrence. And so sometimes we're actually giving them to women who have normal bone density. Um, the, the thought is that somehow uh, these drugs, well, the thought is that cells that might have escaped from the breast before we knew the cancer was there, they tend to kind of nest in the bone marrow. And the thought is that somehow um, these drugs somehow affect the environment in the bone marrow in such a way that it, it makes it less hospitable for cancer cells to survive. So these are, these are either an injection or an IV drug that we um, give once every six months for three years. So moving on to um, targeted treatments, um, this is a huge area um, and in oncology and a huge area in breast cancer right now. So chemotherapy is obviously not targeted. It affects growing and dividing cells throughout the body. In some way, actually, anti-estrogen pills are targeted therapies. Uh, they're, they're targeted at uh, cells that carry estrogen receptors. But there's two broad categories of targeted therapies that we use in oncology. One is um, what we call small molecules. These, these are pills. These are pills that are targeted therapy that basically have um, molecules that cross into um, cancer cells and inactivate a molecular pathway, a specific molecular pathway in the cancer cell that may be turned on, and because that pathway is turned on by a, by a mutation in the cancer cell, the cell is growing and dividing, growing and dividing, growing and dividing. And I, I like to think of these um, oral targeted agents as basically switches that enter into the cell and just switch off that pathway. Um, this, these oral targeted agents are being used now in all types of cancers um, and super, super exciting. Um, another broad category of targeted therapies are what we call monoclonal antibodies. These are protein antibodies that are IVs, um, and they are targeted against uh, proteins that are on the surface of cancer cells that may be causing the cell to grow and divide, grow and divide. And so these, these monoclonal antibody proteins attach to the surface of the cancer cell and basically inhibit its uh, growth. So there's a, a very large and very important group of um, targeted therapies that we use now in breast cancer. This, this, um, this, they're called CDK inhibitors, and uh, there's uh, the three listed there. The, the generic names, um, or the brand names are Ibrands, Kiskali, and Verzenio. These are the ones you see on TV a lot. Um, but these have been enormously beneficial in estrogen receptor positive cancers. They've, um, we, as with any of these newer targeted agents, typically they're, they're, they're tested initially in stage four cancers. And if, there's, if it shows benefit in stage four cancers, then they start to get tested in stage two or three breast cancers to see if, it, um, if, if the treatment can help improve the cure rate. So these CDK inhibitors, we've been using them now for probably four or five years in conjunction with an anti-estrogen pill. So these are, this is a pill and the anti-estrogen medicine is a pill. And they've, um, in, they've prolonged the remission rate for women with stage four breast cancer really by years. They've been, and, and very, typically very, very well tolerated. Well, just like literally last month, uh, the FDA approved a new indication for one of these CDK inhibitors, something, one of them called Verzenio, um, to use in conjunction um, with anti-estrogen treatment for uh, certain stage two and stage three estrogen receptor positive cancers. Um, the, the study that um, led to the FDA approval um, showed that by even three years after um, starting the anti-estrogen medicine, there was um, a, a meaningful difference in terms of re, uh, reducing the risk of the uh, cancer uh, recurring. 
this is at a three-year mark. You know, these studies go on for 10 years, so we'll have to see. I mean, the, the, the role may, the, the findings may change over time, but it was striking enough that this, this particular targeted agent got um, FDA approval last month for this indication. For HER2 positive cancers, um, I mentioned, I've mentioned that now a couple of times. Again, it's a protein that's on the surface of the cell, and um, it's about a quarter of breast cancers that are HER2 positive. Um, here on the left is, a, a, again, it's, it's, on, it's in normal cells, so this, this kind of represents a normal cell with a normal amount of HER2 receptor on the surface. And on the right here is a HER2 positive uh, breast cancer cell that has um, excessive um, expression of the HER2 receptor on the surface. There's monoclonal antibodies, um, and uh, the, two, the two most common are Herceptin and Progetta. These are typically given intravenously, um, and um, these are the ones that are given in conjunction with the chemotherapy that I'd mentioned earlier. I think, um, honestly, probably the biggest um, advance or recognition with uh, HER2-positive cancers uh, in, in terms of our approach to treatment is what I mentioned earlier in that we give the treatment neoadjuvantly for um, uh, most of the can stage two or stage three cancers uh, because it gives us an indication of how effective the treatment is and allows us to then fine tune the post-surgical treatment. One thing that's just happened in the last couple of months, which is really as exciting, is that these, these antibodies are typically given IV, and that means that um, they may be given for a year for somebody with HER2 positive cancer, and um, hence the, these are typically women have to, are keeping a port in, uh, which is a little apparatus under the skin that allows the, the treatment to be given through an IV. Um, the last couple, probably the last six months, um, we've had the ability to actually give these antibodies via injection under the skin, which has been awesome. Um, it allows women to get the port out. It's much less time in the clinic. Um, uh, so they're, it's, it's just uh, more convenient all the way around. The other thing I think that we're going to be seeing more of in HER2 positive cancers, the treatment has typically been directed at um, the, using these antibodies to affect the surface of the cell, but there are a group of oral, new oral agents now that um, new oral pills that um, can uh, uh, affect the HER2 pathway, um, and, and we may be at some point uh, being able to get away from even giving the IV or injection and just using the, the pills. Another super exciting um, oral targeted treatment is something called a PARP inhibitor. These are um, oral targeted agents, pills, that affect the pathway, um, molecular pathway in a cancer cell that um, most typically is seen in patients that carry the BRCA mutation. So women can uh, women that are born with this BRCA mutation, this breast cancer gene, um, typically this BRCA pathway is turned on, um, over, is overactive, leading to the development of cancer, <clears throat> and PARP inhibitors are pills that turn off that pathway. Um, and so we, that is a, definitely an active agent that we've been using now for a while in stage four breast cancers, we just, uh, FDA just approved a new indication, again in the last couple of months, for um, adding it um, in some situations to stage two or stage three uh, uh, patients that are BRCA carriers uh, to help improve the cure rate. The other really exciting um, uh, kind of weighted um, or in interesting um, kind of uh, thing that's been recognized is while some women are born with the BRCA mutation, we recognize now that some tumors, the tumor tissue itself can develop the BRCA mutation. And not just in breast cancer. We can see this with pancreatic cancer or prostate cancer or, or other types of cancers where basically this, this BRCA pathway gets over, it, it's a mutation that develops in the tumor 
even though the woman wasn't born with the BRCA gene. And these PARP inhibitors are um, active in those situations as well. There are so many new targeted oral agents. Um, I've just mentioned the CDK inhibitors, the oral HER2 agents, and the, the PARP inhibitors, but there's so many more that are being um, used now and also in development. It, it, it's, I, I can honestly say I, I can't remember the last time a chemotherapy drug got FDA approved for breast cancer. It's probably been 10 or 15 years, and there's still definitely a role for chemotherapy, but all the, really all the direction of the, the development of uh, new, new treatments is toward these targeted agents. Um, and then the, I, the last, um, the last uh, kind of new treatment I wanted to mention is really exciting, and it's obviously something that I'm sure everybody's heard about, something called what we call immunotherapy. This is not really a targeted treatment. It's a, um, it's a kind of a different category of therapy, and it's, it's basically um, administering intravenously antibodies that um, turn on the, the body's immune system so that the body's own immune system is able to fight the cancer. So very different than chemotherapy. Um, and we are, right now, the, the role of immunotherapy in the breast cancer world is really uh, primarily with triple negative breast cancers. Uh, we, um, it's, it's being looked at in other, you know, estrogen positive and whatnot, but it really the, the biggest role and benefit that we're seeing is in triple negative cancers. Uh, this is a little bit of a complicated cartoon, but just to give you an idea of how these agents work, um, here this, this big brown cell is a tumor cell, um, and this yellow cell is uh, what's called a T lymphocyte, or it's basically a cell in the immune system that um, normally would kind of trigger an immune response to fight the cancer. Um, but what, what these cancer cells can do is um, produce um, proteins that um, get expressed on the surface. That would be these little blue, um, these little blue things here. Uh, these proteins get expressed on the surface of the tumor cell, and basically, then it allows it to bind to the immune cell in such a way that it kind of paralyzes the immune cell, and it allows it allows the cancer cell to hide kind of from the immune system. Um, and so what these antibodies do, these are the, the gray, gray um, pieces here. These antibodies basically allow the cancer cell and this quote paralyzed immune cell to now separate, allowing the body's immune system to see the cancer cell and then mount a, a, an immune response to the cancer. This is, such an exciting um, treatment for cancer. It's being used in so many different types of cancers, and it's been um, what's but what's been really um, exciting for triple negative cancers is that just the the end of July this year, the FDA approved the use of the immunotherapy in conjunction with chemotherapy um, to uh, use immunotherapy with chemotherapy for stage two and stage three triple negative cancers. Um, and that because studies have shown that um, in just even a short interval, three, three year follow up, there was uh, an improvement in um, reducing the chance of the cancer recurring. So um, this is um, very, a very exciting um, area right now for um, in, in the triple negative uh, world. And I, I should, I, I didn't make a slide on this, but there's many, many oral targeted agents that are being looked at and tested and, and uh, some very promising for triple negative cancer as well. The side effects of these, uh, of immunotherapy is actually kind of exactly opposite of chemotherapy. It's kind of an over stimulated immune system. So sometimes the immune system can inappropriately uh, direct, uh, attack the liver. So like an autoimmune hepatitis or um, cause diarrhea, so autoimmune colitis. Um, these are, we're really familiar with the side effects and managing the side effects. And uh, 
uh, for the most part, these are really well-tolerated treatments. So I, I wanted to just end um, with um, just kind of making a comment. I mean, I've given you a, a window into the you know, medical oncology piece of uh, breast cancer, but really um, I would be remiss to really not point out that this is a, uh, it's a really very, any, any, um, in any situation where somebody's diagnosed with breast cancer, it's really important that there's a very um, multidisciplinary team approach. And um, we have a great multidisciplinary team um, at Boulder Community H Hospital. We have, a, we have a weekly breast cancer conference um, every Tuesday morning. Every, every woman that's newly diagnosed with breast cancer gets reviewed at the conference. Um, and, and actually several times until um, she's, till final treatment recommendations have been um, uh, determined by the group. The, the, the breast cancer, in our breast cancer conference, I mean, just, I've listed just the various um, uh, disciplines that um, participate. Obviously radiology, sur surgery, the breast surgeons, medical oncologists like myself, the radiation doctors, plastic surgery, uh, we have a genetics team, Physical therapy, super important. Um, navigation, uh, many of you may know our, our nurse navigator, Nana Bo Christensen, who's just so helpful when uh, women are newly diagnosed, helping them kind of understand what next, what to do. It's, it can just be totally overwhelming. Um, we have integrative therapies. Um, we have our, uh, and then our research team. So, um, it's just, uh, it's, it's always just important to point out that it's, it's very much a, a team approach. And, uh, um, and I, I wanted to uh, just end here with this last slide for anybody who's interested in any of the resources that uh, Boulder Community Health has, that we've got the mammography unit, the Center for Integrative Care, uh, rehab, Nana's, uh, the nurse navigator's uh, phone number is there, and then Rocky Mountain Cancer Center there, is there as well. And I think I'll end at this point and uh, take any questions, Wendy, or thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. That was so very informative and such exciting new news and developments for, for us to look into and discuss with you. Um, so we do have uh, several questions, and we'll take as many as we can here in the time we have left. The first question is, what role can a PET scan play in diagnosis and treatment of breast cancer, a PET scan? Right. So a PET scan, um, we don't use PET scans to diagnose uh, breast cancer. Uh, really, the, um, I mean, that's a whole separate talk, but, you know, mammography still is the mainstay, um, and then there are some other modalities that, uh, uh, potentially ultrasound or MRI that can help in the diagnosis. The way that um, the way that we might use a PET scan is if somebody is newly diagnosed uh, with breast cancer, and um, if there's some concern that there could be um, cancer that's already spread um, and known to have spread to the bone or the lung or the liver. So we don't use PET scans very often for newly diagnosed patients. We might if it's a stage two or stage three breast cancer, but the chance of having cancers spread already at the time of diagnosis is very low. Um, so we mainly use the PET scan to, to stage, uh, as a staging tool, um, if we think there's any uh, chance uh, that something might have spread. How rare is low, okay, I, I'm going to already say some of these words I don't pronounce very well. I'll do my very best. No I problem. apologize if I, if I, you know, just uh, butcher them, but it's lobular cancer. How rare is that? So I didn't, um, yeah, I didn't mention that. There's different types of breast cancer. Uh, most breast cancer starts in a part of the breast called the ducts. Those are called, that's called ductal cancer. And that's it's probably about 70% of cancers are ductal cancers. Lobular cancers um, start in a little bit different area of the breast. And probably about 20% of breast cancer, 15 or 20% are lobular. So not, not super rare, but um, not the most common either. 
For the most part, we treat lobular cancers and ductal cancers the same way. They just start in, in a little bit of different area in the breast. Uh, a viewer is asking, can you address the medication being developed at Cleveland Clinic for triple negative breast cancer? Um, I, I don't know what, which one that is. There are so yeah. many in development, um, but if right. I will say, if that, if that person has an oncologist, uh, it's a great question to direct to their oncologist. <laughs> okay. Is the 2 to 3% reduction in risk by taking bisulfonate worth it in side effects? It's a conversation, um, as, as with anything, and I actually with a lot of these treatments, I, I debated whether or not I should start to get into side effects, potential side effects or not. It's a conversation, because for some women, it may not be of benefit. Maybe the cancer is so low risk to begin with. I mean, that one cancer I showed that had a 3% risk of recurrence, that, I mean, there's probably not a meaningful benefit of a bisphosphonate there. Um, uh, there's a rare, a very rare side effect that is potentially, can be very serious, uh, that can affect the jawbone. Uh, but when we give it to, to women that have good dentition and give it the way that we give it here like six times, the incidence of that is maybe less than a percent. It's very, very rare. Um, but some women, you know, may not um, choose to do it because of a concern of side effects. Some women get a little achy and kind of flu-like uh, for a couple of days afterwards. So as with any of this, it's always a conversation about pros and cons. Oncotype or yeah. mammoprint? What is the difference? So um, mammoprint, um, I, the way I have kind of explained it is that um, well, mammoprint kind of is the European equivalent of oncotype. Um, it, 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 so it's, um, it, it looks at more genes. Uh, mammoprint looks at like 70 genes within the tumor. Oncotype looks at like 20. Um, we, they're, they're very similar. I think um, until the data came out on um, how to potentially use oncotype in node positive patients, there was more data uh, with mammoprint on node positive patients, but they're, they're very similar. It, we, would, it, 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 we just wouldn't ever like get, there's no, there's no reason to ever get both of the tests. It's not like one, it's not like they're so different that it's helpful to get both. Um, and there's some subtle reasons why one might be chosen over the other, but they're pretty similar. How can you have a clean, ma a clean mammogram, a clean mammography uh, one year, and then the next year have stage three breast cancer? So that's a great question. <laughs> so mammogram is not perfect. Um, a mammogram probably does not see at least 20% of breast cancers, okay? So mammography is a very good tool to screen a large population, but it is not the end all and be all. Some, so some breast cancers just don't show up well on mammography. Um, so that could be one reason why that happened to that person. Um, and so it may be that by the time, it may be that it just wasn't showing up and that by the time the cancer got diagnosed, um, either the patient or the doctor was able to feel it. Another possibility is that some cancers are uh, growing, and, and this, this would be less likely, I think, but some cancers grow fast enough that we could see a change in a mammogram. I mean, that we could, by the time, that there could be a change in them. I can't tell by that question whether or not there was a change in the mammogram or whether or not it was just never seen. But some cancers are fast enough growing that from one year to the next, we we now could see something and it could be more advanced. We have time for, oh, a couple, two, three more questions. Uh, is it always stage three if, nymph, load, if nymph, lymph nodes are involved? No, no. Um, it, if, um, 
I mean, it kind of depends. If there's, if there's more than, if there's four more lymph nodes, it would be stage three. Uh, but stage, but one or two or three lymph nodes could still be stage two. I see. Is an anastrozole an immune suppression drug? No, no. And that's um, actually in the in the world of COVID right now. That's a really good question. Um, these these aroma these anti-estrogen medicines, tamoxifen, anastrozole, the, the aromatase inhibitors. Those anti-estrogen pills uh, do not impact the immune system. How do you know if, if that drug is working for you? Can you determine this? That is such a good question. And unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, because the reality is, um, I mean, honestly, there are plenty of women that could have surgery for breast cancer and radiation and never have the cancer come back just without any further treatment. I mean, that's a possibility. Um, and so it's possible that somebody's take, people take these medicines for the possibility that microscopic cells are there. And we don't, we don't have a good way, or we don't have a way of knowing who has microscopic cells and who doesn't. So somebody dies at age 90 uh, of old age without their breast cancer ever coming back will never know was it because they took the anastrozole or not. Now, if there's a recurrence of the c cancer, then we know that it didn't work. Um, but again, stage one, two, and three cancers, we're giving the treatment um, in the absence of any known disease. We're giving it for the possibility that microscopic cells are there. The tumor testing, do you do that automatically or does a patient have to request? It, the well, tumor what's testing. automatically done is the estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. Those are automatically done, and there's a few other um, there's a few other markers that I didn't mention that automatically get done. Um, if there's going to be, um, you know, oncotype or uh, those, I mean, that's not an automatic. That's uh, kind of a decision that gets made between the doctor and the patient. Wonderful. So thank. Thank you, Dr. Jensen. I'm sorry if we couldn't answer everyone's question, but we do um, appreciate your time and expertise. It was very informative, exciting new, new technologies and findings. And so for everyone watching, we have come to the end of our time. A recording of tonight's lecture is available at bch.org backslash live stream. You'll find a, a library of all of our lectures. You will receive a post-lecture survey by email. Please uh, take a moment to fill this out. We do appreciate that. And again, please visit bch.org for information on the COVID-19 vaccinations. And um, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, doctor, again, and have a good night. Thank you.